<laughs> Good morning and welcome to the Northern Institute's uh, People Policy and Less Seminar Series 2021. My name is Khalid Khan and I am a research active senior lecturer in mathematics with um, CDU's College of Indigenous Futures, um, Education and Arts. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. For those of us on site in Darwin, it is the Larakia people. We pay our respects to Larakia elders past, present and emerging and further extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Islander uh, people joining us today. Today we welcome Northern Institutes. Today we welcome to Northern Institute Associate Professor uh, Brown Hearing from QUT and Professor Grace Sara. They will be co-presenting about the ARC project, unlocking the learning potential of the incarcerated and low socioeconomic status young people, which focuses on juvenile detention center in Queensland. Um, one juvenile center. Um, in Queensland, or oh, there's you, two. Yeah, right. two. Yeah. But this is one, the project focuses on one. one. Okay. Mm. Uh, there will be a question and answer session um, after the presentation, so please save your questions till then. And if you are, you are joining us via Zoom, uh, write your questions into the QA section at the bottom of your screen. I will now hand over to Professor Brown Ewing and Professor Grace Sarah to begin on the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, before we start, uh, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land as well, the Larrakee people, and we would also um, like to pay our respects to past um, and emerging um, Indigenous people as well. Do you uh, want me to yeah, introduce yeah, myself? Yeah, yeah. So um, just before we start, just a bit of background on who I am and, and stuff. So my name's uh, Grace Sara. My um, background is my mum and dad. Are, my mum is Aboriginal. She's um, the oldest of 19 uh, children. And my dad's Torres Strait Islander. So my family is from the Biri Gabba Nation, so I'm Bindal and Biri. And on my dad's side, um, from uh, Moor Island and um, a number of other islands as well in the Torres Strait, so my dad's a savage. So my family are in North Queensland around the Townsville area. And uh, my work is, uh, I'm primary school trained, so I have a degree in education. So initially I started, started off teaching in primary school, but now, um, and I've moved from uh, primary school, I've done a stint in um, secondary and then um, in the tertiary sector where I'm with um, QUT. I've been there for over 13 years now. And uh, my research and teaching is in the School of Early Childhood and Inclusive Education. Uh, and it sits within the Faculty of Creative Industries, Education and Justice. The work that I do is uh, primarily in Indigenous research, uh, looking at Indigenous research methodologies, um, looking at work around whole school change processes and, and leadership, and I also do work around identity, <coughs> health and wellbeing, as well as the mathematics that we're going to present today. You're so busy, Grace. So, <laughs> <laughs> so good morning, everyone. My name is Bron Ewing, and um, it's a Welsh name, and um, but I'm not Welsh, but I just prefer to be called Bron. Um, so um, I was originally from Sydney and slowly made my way up the coast, but long before Sydney, it was a case of Scotland, um, Norway and, um, and England. And then long before that, as I've come to learn, it all, uh, goes all the way down to Jamaica and then across to Central Africa. Um, so that's turned out to be a really interesting story for me. Um, so what do I do at QUT? I, Grace and I have been working for over 10 years now together on numerous projects that have taken us across um, Australia, um, um, particularly across Queensland and working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and low SES communities, whether that's metropolitan or in regional areas. Um, my core focus is around mathematics and the issue is that um, having been a classroom teacher many years ago, 
I could see that there were particular ways that mathematics was um, taught that had been going on for over 100 years. And of course, mathematics is actually a social filter. And it, there are people who are in it, and there are people who are outside. And of course, overrepresented on those, uh, in terms of those groups being on the outside, were those children who could not crack the code. And so um, children from low SES communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, children and young people, and also um, um, EALD students. And so that became my interest. And of course, having a very strong sense of social justice um, and also understanding that we all matter and children matter in this world, the two combined ended up being the driver for my research um, to the point you know, where we are now. I teach as well. I haven't given up my teaching yet. So I'm working with undergrads and postgrads. And I also um, supervise uh, a number of PhD students, master's students and professional doctorates. And one of the products of my hard work is sitting right um, with us here. Yeah. So thanks, Joel, for being a great student. Yeah, so thank you. Are we doing this from here or are you doing it from there? Or what have I done? I'm so sorry. I'll give it to you. <laughs> 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 now this is going to be really dangerous. All right. Okay. So what we're going to go through, um, in many ways it follows standard format, but, um, you know, there are times when a standard format is good. Um, so a little bit about the project. Um, uh, a bit about the literature, and the literature is really quite interesting because we 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 know that there's um, you know quite a bit of work with regards to um, children and young people in juvenile detention. The core part here is what we don't know a great deal about is the education, you know what goes on, um, theoretical frameworks, methodology, um, findings, discussion, and then of course some questions. So the way that Grace and I actually present, we just Kind of tag team. We don't. We don't need a lectern. We just. We work together. Okay. All right. So the aim of this particular project was um, to develop knowledge and understanding concerning mathematics education and the mathematics learning potential of incarcerated Indigenous and low socioeconomic um, status young people in Queensland. And our intention was to design a, a culturally responsive tailored mathematics education uh, intervention for juvenile detention centres that would form the basis for a model of education for children and young uh, people who are detained in juvenile detention centres. So when we say a cultural response of tailored mathematics education in intervention, it wasn't a mathematics program. So we worked with the educators within the classroom and in the school. Okay, so a little bit of background here, and um, um, we put this background in because I think a part of our role with the project and the dissemination is raising people's awareness. And, um, you know, it's too easy to say that, oh, all these children are naughty, they just need to be, you know, locked away. And, of course, we're hearing that it's come through continually in the media in Queensland and certain areas in Queensland, but or the general public don't really fully understand, um, you know, the issues for young people. So um, we did work um, quite a bit with the, the children and young people in the centre. So in Queensland, in fact, right across the country, children are incarcerated from 10 years of age. And so if you have 10-year-old uh, children or you are a teacher of 10-year-old children or you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren who are 10 years old, it's really quite startling when you walk into a classroom and you've got a 10 year old it's here. Um, yeah, so, but the core issue here in this first part is that we know that education is an anti poverty strategy. And yet, it is also the strategy that works to marginalise. So it's anti poverty. And we doubt that education is really important. And I, I will argue that it's important. But at the same time, 
we've got issues with our education because there are children and young people being excluded from it. So um, with the second point, it is not sufficient to, um, when, when children end up, uh, or when children start to go through the system, it becomes um, a, a apparent that the children are, um, um, they're, they're tried in a sense of viewed as adults, right? Now, although we don't necessarily hear those words being spoken when the children are going through the court system, it's interesting because there are parallels between adult um, um, justice as well as um, child justice. And of course, the issue with that is there's an age compression. So the child is spoken to, not necessarily as a 10 year old, who is still growing, developing physically, cognitively and so on, but the compression of some of these laws is coming down. And of course these children at times are being spoken to as adults and they're, they're 10, all right? So when we talk about children in this project, we're talking about child, minor, um, juvenile, young person, youth and children. And of course, that refers to all children under the age of 18. So we don't talk about these children as inmates or whatever the case may be. We talk about these, these, these children as children or young people. <clears throat> so um, as I've uh, made the point, um, 10 years of age, and of course there is increasing evidence, and I know that colleagues in this room would know that there is increasing evidence that a juvenile detention centre is not an appropriate place to put children. Um, but the current leadership of Australia, and indeed previous leadership of Australia, is still not um, shifting in terms of um, increasing the age of incarceration. If we could do away with it altogether, much like what they're trialling in Tasmania, I think that that would be really good. Um, but it is still um, happening here. So, and of course, the consensus from the literature tells us that the um, developments and neuroscientific evidence shows that adolescent brains continue to mature well beyond the teenage years, into the 20s. All right, so um, I'm going to go through in particular the first point because I also have to be aware of time. So we know that we have a Department of Housing, um, we have a Department of Education, Training, we have um, Health. So we have a number of departments and from those departments we have a number of policies. And of course, for the children who are in the juvenile detention centres, what we're learning is that there are children who are there because of policy issues. So we could use the term welfare here, but because of failed policies, if we've got children who are going in and continually breaking into people's houses to empty the fridge, you have to question why are these children breaking into houses and emptying the fridge? Um, it's for food. Um, but what we're seeing is that there are almost two groups of children in a sense, and I'm mindful of constructing a binary here. We've got children who are incarcerated because of welfare issues, of, because of policy failure. And we've got children who do commit serious crimes. The issue is for those children who um, are there because of welfare issues, once they're incarcerated and if they've been incarcerated you know, whether it's three weeks or whether it's six months or, or three years, once you get into that system, that pipeline is very difficult to get out of, okay? And it's a really, really big issue, that point around policy. So within the curriculum, which was part of the research that we looked at, there was little, very little known about the schooling and the types of education programs that... Um, happened within detention, juvenile detention centres. So the, um, that was part of the work that we wanted to look at because in our state schools, we use the national curriculum. However, when we went into the detention centre, although it falls under the state education system, they have a variety of other vet programs, other types of school programs that they actually operate within. 
which was really interesting because then it was like, well, what, what programs are you using to actually lead the curriculum when they're grabbing from everywhere? Um, there was also a little note about um, best practice for educating young people. And when we talk about best practice, we're talking about types of pedagogy that was being used within the classrooms with um, these uh, educators. Um, and in terms of the curriculum, there was the challenges that were identified for teachers because uh, some of the young people that were incarcerated may have only been there for a short period of time. They may have only been there for like a week or two weeks and then some were there for longer stays. So in terms of developing the curriculum and developing their learning programs and stuff like that, that was fluctuating as well. So there, there were lots of challenges for the teachers and that's not making excuses for the teachers because what we did find is, is that um, in terms of the curriculum that we were looking at and looking at through observations and things like that, um, there were probably gaps in the teaching pedagogy and that was the role that we played in helping to fill some of those, those gaps in terms of cultural, cultural and responsive pedagogy when working with um, Indigenous students, but there are diverse students from all different backgrounds in there. So some of the work that we were working out, uh, sharing, could actually uh, be used across the board with other groups of students. Oh, sorry, Grace, did I just jump too fast then? No, no I didn't. No, that's fine. Okay, so um, when we talk about these culturally, culturally responsive pedagogies, so we know that it's a term that's coming to the fore um, in the research, but also um, to the fore in a number of conversations with schools and so on. But um, it's still, we are still in new territory here in, in, in Australia. It's a term that's actually emerged out of the Canadian and also the New Zealand literature. And, um, but what's really interesting and, uh, is that we can't always sort of take that stamp and then stamp it over into this country and say, okay, we're going to do exactly the same model here as what was there. It doesn't quite work like that as we know. But what we've done is actually look at this in, in rather than just specifically focusing in on what's going on in the, in the classroom, and those culturally responsive pedagogies, we've gone a little bit broader. And there's some points here to do this. We've come to learn that if you are wanting to um, engage in culturally responsive pedagogies, it's not something that, okay, outside the door, I don't engage in that kind of thinking, but inside the door, when I've got all the students, that's when I apply it. It doesn't work like that. You have to have a strong sense of social justice and it is about tearing down old structures and old ways of thinking and forming new ideas. It is about new forms of social interaction. So how do we interact with the diverse children that we have in our classrooms or indeed the schools? Um, how is it uh, inclusive of cultures? So new ways to look at the inclusion of cultures looking at the inequality that comes with education but also looking at the impact of the distribution of wealth okay um, and new ways to resist oftentimes we see oh, i'm not gay enough to say anything wrong because i really don't want to upset my principal or you know i don't want to sort of make my stance be known well that's a problem okay um, but we need to support teachers with looking at new ways to resist the status quo. So if mathematics continues to be taught out of a textbook, everybody sits and watches the teacher model, okay, the I do, what is it? No, I do, you, we do, you do, the grrr model, um, you know, um, looking at new ways to maintain order and cultural safety, looking at new ways to reach children, and this is a really big one, to recover from education exclusion and failure. Every child that we have worked with in the juvenile detention centre is recovering from education exclusion and failure. How do we support those children? How do we support children all together? Um, new ways to show Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and low socioeconomic children that they are valued in the world and they matter. They matter to themselves 
They matter to their family. They matter to community. They matter. They matter. And then, of course, new ways to establish an education system that works for everyone. And our lovely conversations with Robin yesterday. Thank you, Robin. Um, you know, you're looking at those schools that are, I think we use that term, you know, governing themselves, but it's not quite the right term either. But, you know, looking at those new ways and especially those children who are put at the edges of classrooms and society, just like the children in the centre. Just before we click on to the next one, also as part of the cultural response pedagogy that we did, in terms of doing professional development with educators, when I, I spoke about looking at whole school change, so we don't, we didn't look at mathematics in isolation in terms of working with maths educators. So what we did when we spoke about um, looking at ways to resist, we actually got educators to reflect on their own underlying cultural assumptions or biases that they actually bring with them into their classrooms or you know that they've that they might have not only about uh, young people incarcerated but in terms of assumptions about indigenous people people from diverse backgrounds all of those sorts of things and um it can be quite contentious when you're doing the, that sort of work, but it's important that if we've got educators working with Indigenous young people or young people from diverse backgrounds, then they're already challenges that exist for those students. Um, if teachers are unaware that they have these unconscious biases um, that exist when they're teaching. And part of the cultural response and pedagogy stuff that we were doing was getting educators to actually think about bringing in the lived experiences and the realities of where these students were coming from within the detention centres. So within the, the centre that we worked, there were students, our children, our young people from all different backgrounds. So we couldn't say, yeah, you know, we're going in this community, this is something that you can do and do it across the board. So it actually had to, um, uh, embed Indigenous perspectives, but at the same time consider the differences, because although we are all Indigenous or we might all be Aboriginal within the centre, we come from diverse backgrounds and that's something that's really important um, to consider and understand. Um, oh, I just want to say, okay. Yeah. I, th I think um, just in terms, we, we spoke about providing a culturally um, safe home place in terms of students, also having um, high expectations of where the students are coming from, uh, of the students in front of you. So yes, they're incarcerated youth, but have high expectations in terms of what they're doing. Um, and because it's trying to break down the barriers of them um, coming back into the detention centre and high expectations relationships really important and and the work i think in our theoretical framework which is coming up uh the work of sarah around um i don't know if you've heard of the strongest smarter philosophy so about acknowledging and embracing aboriginal identity acknowledging and embracing torres strait islander identity it's about um a community engagement and high expectations relationships now it it's very difficult to do face-to-face -face community engagement in a detention center. But there are other ways and other avenues where you can privilege indigenous voices within your teaching spaces within, with, uh, in the detention center. So I think we've probably uh, kind of pulls together, I think what we've talked about, Grace. Yeah, so in terms of just the connecting the mathematics curriculum, so that's what we were, we're, we're looking at doing, not looking at mathematics in isolation. How do you embed the Indigenous perspectives? But I think when we do professional development, and what I find is that when we're working with um, maths educators, but even, you know, educators in different curriculum areas, they sort of just expect you to give, give you sort of, how do I just teach the mathematics to these students? but you actually have to look at the broader picture around what is going on in your schools and classrooms. So within the detention centre, attendance was compulsory unless there was an issue. But within education, attendance is a big issue for some of our, our students and young people to, 
to attend school. So those are issues that will impact on the mathematics learning that occurs in your classroom, hence the mathematics outcomes and achievements of the students. Me? Yeah. Okay, so we used um, two theoretical frameworks and, and Grace has already mentioned that we um, drew on Chris Zara's work from um, the Stronger Smarter Institute. Um, but in particular, um, the material or the work in um, his I think 2012 um, book towards a, a pedagogy for emancipation to create a new theoretical framework. What we did was um, we combined the work of um, Chris Zara's with Julie Boyd's work on that professional learning component. Um, so it was a, just bringing the two together and looking at ways that we can support these teachers to, to challenge themselves, but also to um, change some of the practices that they were employing in the classroom, in this case, in mathematics. Um, so what we did was we also drew on um, the work of um, Linda Talway Smith, um, and in particular, decolonizing methodologies. And the reason why we drew on that work was because one of the critical components in the study is reporting back and and but also um, hearing the voices so we were in classrooms we did do um, our teaching in those classrooms we sat down with the, the children and worked with the children we worked with the teacher we worked with the teacher aides um, um, and we are also going beyond that and um, reporting back to community as well. Um, and Grace, you might like to talk yeah, a little bit so, more about that. So in terms of what we did was part of the research was we were observing the teachers pedagogy in the classroom um, and then we would have conversations and then we would actually go in and model some teaching lessons with um, the students or, or the teacher. Um, and part of the work that we did was what was interesting was that in the detention centre, there was um, there were high numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people, but Indigenous support people within the classrooms that we worked in, there didn't seem to be too many Indigenous support teacher aides in the classroom. Um, and then there were some inc incidences where um, young people had had been out of the detention centre, come back into the detention centre, and they were doing high fives and everything because the they had a connection with the support person, mm -hmm. Indigenous support person in the classroom, um, not so much the teacher, but the support person, where it was like um, a safe, the, the feeling culturally safe, um, because the the teacher aid is like, oh, you're back again. And it was like, you know, giving hugs. And so this was their support area, um, which was it, which in terms with the educators, we were trying to say to them, it's about building relationships with the students that you have in front of you. Even if they're only there for a short period of time, it's getting to know those students and where they're coming from and who they are and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and also um, what we've done is we've now taken a, a step outside the detention centre. So we're now engaging in the communities of, of some, where some of these young people have come from, sharing the work that we're doing, but also looking at how we might be able to assist. So when they go back out into their communities and they're going back either into schools or into other alternative education setting, settings, we're working with what can what can we do to assist you in the community so we're working with indigenous people in communities in so we've got these resources but we're creating other resources to assist those educators in mainstream classrooms to help engage young people from the detention center the the the, the there was a gap in our study for three years around community and it became quite startling for us because in the centre there was actually a cultural team in the centre and this is the school and this is the centre and we didn't know and nor did the school 
and the cultural team in the centre did not communicate with the school and vice versa. So the cultural team were doing programs outside school. Um, so the school was doing the stuff in school and then they had the cultural team doing their stuff outside, but there was no interaction together. Um, yeah, and so when we were sharing our work and um, it was interesting as outsiders coming into that system of saying, are you aware there's a cultural team that you can, you know, work with? Um, so, yeah. And, and we also uh, discovered that within the department itself, so child safety, they were not fully aware of just who was in that cultural team in the centre mm -hmm. that is overseen by child safety. Which is problematic then, because, mm -hmm. I mean, this is top, coming from the top and then mm -hmm. this is how you see the implications of policy. Um, so, Grace, do you want to talk about the professional development that so, we did? Yes, yeah, so part of the uh, cross-cultural uh, professional development that we did was that I, I spoke about looking at um, uh, the mindsets and cultural assumptions, but we also look, use um, Indigenous frameworks as well for educators to, to actually unpack some of their teaching pedagogy and work that they were doing within mathematics. Um, so we used um, an Ngori process, I'm not quite sure if you've heard of Ngori, um, which Scott Gringe um, developed with his people. So with the, within the Ngori process, it's actually uh, looking at um, community um, collaboration. However, what we did was we adapted it in terms of um, putting mathematics in the middle, because you could have put anything in the middle. But within that Indigenous framework, um, we then looked at different aspects within the cycle around mathematics and the educators and teaching. But it was um, what it involved is it, it looked at Indigenous ways of, of doing business and, and doing things. Um, so we used uh, the indig that Indigenous framework and a lot of our work also, like I said, was around the Stronger Smarter work, um, Chris's uh, philosophy, which we were um, shared about, but also getting teachers to actually think about how do you acknowledge and embrace identities of students that are in your classroom? Because in these classrooms, the walls are pretty bare, um, except in one particular classroom, they had, you know, some beautiful posters mm -hmm. up of um, Indigenous um, timelines. I don't know if you uh, it's, it's crossing it's cultures, embedding mm -hmm. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So they have a timeline. So we had done professional development and used these um, posters. And then when we actually went into the maths classroom of one of these educators, he had actually found a set of the posters. So he had them up in his classroom and he left them in his classroom. So when he was teaching, there were um, posters around the classroom that actually showed that in this classroom, we acknowledge and we embrace your um, identity of where you come from. And none of those posters got removed from, you know, you'd expect kids to pull them down. And um, they were there. He was, he was one of our uh, really good maths educators that did cultural response pedagogy really well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, Grace, can I just um, build on from there? So um, we had the opportunity when we're working with the teachers to uh, use other posters. And of course, you would know about the the big CSIRO um, uh, uh, tracks seasonal calendars series. And of course, you know, when, when we worked with them on that, because we're looking at qualitative measures of time, not just quantitative being a capitalist country, um, but looking at the qualitative and, you know, they looked at it and said, can't see the maths in that room. And it's like, okay, so we are going to unpack this now. And the same thing applied with the crossing borders posters for some teachers. Well, I can't see the maths in this. And we're looking at, I mean, when you look at the seven posters, I think all up, and you look at time is just one element among many in, in the posters, but it's like, you know, you need to reframe your thinking and just really unpack and tease out 
what is actually in some of this material instead of giving these children worksheets and textbooks. Because the posters went from pre-contact mm -hmm. right through to today. Mm -hmm. um, and so we unpack that. So, so just quickly, um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of depth here. So we did use thematic analysis, discourse analysis, and um, we used, um, not highly sophisticated because we didn't need to, we did um, diagnose, uh, diagnostic assessments with the students. And I'm not putting up the results here, so we're not sharing all the data with you. But there's a couple of elements that I do want to share with you in a moment. Um, so for this um, study, we looked, uh, worked with approximately 100 young people in detention. Uh, we worked with three directors because it's um, sliding doors. Um, we worked with three principals, again, sliding doors, three heads of curriculum, sliding doors, um, and eight maths teachers. And currently today, there's one of those teachers left. So it's that turnover of staff. Um, all right, so what I'm going to show you now is it's going to be really hard for you to read this, but I want to explain how it came about. So we um, conducted one-on-one um, -on -one and focus group interviews. And I've always, as a researcher uh, across multiple projects, had the suspicion that we, we, we get what we ask for. And so, um, and that's fine. Um, it's up to um, uh, participants to share what they would like. But having analysed the data, what we came across was a number of really broad themes. So we narrowed, started to narrow it down because there were things coming up consistently. And of course, they're actually here on the screen. So assessment, extrinsic, intrinsic reward, one-on-one -on -one teaching strategies, embedding Indigenous perspectives, instructional strategies, differentiation, but uh, reasonable adjustments, not just differentiation broadly. Um, and this also ties in with age appropriate um, experiences and then classroom management. Then what we did was we um, got the teachers back and we interviewed them again individually. And we had these on cards. And what they had to do was put these cards in an order of priority. What did they see was the most important um, um, aspect when it came to their teaching strategies and what have you in the classroom. And of course, it's a little bit hard to track, but um, I, I, I'm just going to choose um, Daniel at the moment. Um, so Daniel was a, a, a secondary maths teacher, um, but if we track the blue arrow, um, and of course we start to see that we come here, then we go back here, um, I'm just trying to work out where we go to next. We, oh no, we come here, then we go back to here, and then we come over to embedding Indigenous pedagogy. So we know, based on this, that there are two teachers that just did not see um, in that really intense interview that embedding Indigenous perspectives was a priority. Now, so for Daniel, it was rigour, um, observations in the classroom. It was about rigour. It is about you do this first before you do this. Everything was lockstep and it was straight out of the textbook. This is how the children learn. They must learn the mathematics theory broad before they go to the next step. Okay, so it was so the interesting resistance that came through as well. Okay, probably about 10 minutes. Yeah. Thanks, Grace. So just, yeah, it's, it's all good. So <laughs> these are just some excerpts. Um, I'm just, I'll give you a, a minute or so just to, I'm not going to read them out to you. Um, but this was Kalila, um, and she was um, quite, quite, you know, keen to embed Indigenous perspectives in her work. And um, I'm going to just quickly move on here. I know that the interview transcripts are always interesting. Whoops. And this is Daniel. So across the whole time we were there, and we were there from 2017, probably mm -hmm. in the school. Mm -hmm. um, so we were there for about three, four years, he's, and he's still there, but still does not get the concept of, and the importance of engaging and embedding Indigenous perspectives um, into the mathematics. So most of the students are Yeah. And because that traditional math, you know, thinking yeah. that this yeah. is how we do maths. Yeah. We had a lot of fun in Warren's classroom. Yeah, it was good. We had, well, we didn't have the wigs, but the 
children had. And Warren was the person I spoke about that had a really deadly classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see from the, the, um, the qualitative data where he said he builds relationships with his students, he connects to the students. He took them outside the classroom and did hands-on stuff, you know, with his, with his students and stuff. Yeah, most teachers then would not be brave enough to actually take their teachers outside the class, their children outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a little bit from the students. We had some funny moments with the students too. We got wicked sense of humour, and they tell you straight up, like, "Oh yeah, that's crap," and it's colourful. So, so the posters <laughs> that we've done working with the students and the teachers have gone through a number of different versions. So, um, yeah. It, uh, yeah, so it, it, and interesting, uh, some of them were talking about, um, you know, well, you know, if I bought a slab of beer or, you know, it's because like, we, we, that we have to have boundaries um, in terms of what we talk about with the children, you know, their children, and they were sort of heading down a path and it's like, like come back, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm including mathematics into the really yeah, hard experiences to, to perhaps why they were there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so in terms of the um, the posters, so these are the posters that were created uh, within the um, with the, the educators and the students. And so on one side, you've got the literacy. So we've incorporated literacy. So there was a reading to learn program with the within the whole centre, and within the centre every um, curriculum area, every educator had to do this reading to learn um, as part of the, the first bit of their lesson. So we incorporated reading to learn and then in the middle section of the poster is where we had some visual representation of whatever it was about and then where the keywords, um, so this was teacher directed. So at the most there may have been um, there was usually mainly around six, six young people in the classroom, but some of the teachers could have had up to eight. Um, and then there were questions around it. So these posters were designed in themes. So we had sp uh, sports themes, we had food, we had um, animals. And in terms of the animals, it was trying to uh, link it to various totems as well. We had artists, uh, we had historical, um, things as well. So the posters that we've given out, and there are some examples here, it was actually looking at um, using role models or connecting. And when I say role models, it wasn't just connecting with big stars like the football stars or um, Mark Oliver. We actually included some of the role models, artists from people's communities and we included those people into our posters because they're role models in their communities um and we looked at you know environmental stuff around total tagging um and about it was all about the embedding indigenous perspectives now these lessons only probably would have gone maybe 15 minutes um 20 minutes at the most but they were so the teacher can't just give the things and say go and do it um so they actually had to engage the students in the process and work through it uh, with them so these are the posters that we've developed. Do you want to share them out? Yeah, so we, we trial, um, I think Grace has already said, we actually trial these with the children and the young people. And uh, interesting, one of the comments was, there's colour. In maths, you don't have colour. It's right or wrong. It's a binary construction. So um, it was uh, something that they um, really engaged in. Did you mention about finding the key words? Um, I, I'll be yeah. briefed over it, but can I just go back to the colour? So in yeah. terms of the colours, the booklets, the young people were working from were just all black and white. So they come in, they were tested uh, when they came in, um, and then they were levelled. And so then they were given... Um, the max booklets. This is the level that you're at. So this is what you work on. So um, you notice the previous slide as well as this one. So this is um, in Maori language, and so we actually worked with the linguist from the University of Canterbury, and we actually brought him over, and he has done the translation. So you'll see for the Maori posters, um, they'll actually have Maori on one side and English on the other because um, we, there was a teacher in the centre who was not a maths teacher, 
but she was able to develop a Maori language program because there were a number of Maori children in the in the in the centre. And of course, um, it, you know, we've supported her with uh, purchasing materials as well as developing these posters along the way. The challenge is, so when we present this to the children, and they go, so where's our language? Okay, so we've got Māori. Um, yeah, so with the Māori posters, with the cultural teacher, um, what we found is we worked with the cultural teacher because there was no Indigenous, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander culture teacher. They didn't have a cultural program. So they had the outside cultural program and the cultural team, but they didn't have a cultural program inside the school, inside their school. Um, so the reason why on the uh, Māori posters is we've got... Um, English on one side and we've got the Māori language on the other is we didn't do that with the Indigenous ones because we have diverse languages. What about using Aboriginal language? No, so we didn't, we didn't do that. Because Would it be possible though? Probably not because the Aboriginal English depends on where the communities are that are from. So, and it wasn't, and because there are diverse groups in detention centres, but even in our own communities, there's diverse groups, but in the detention centre, so you'll see that these ones are blank, um, but the Maori ones have the language, but we only did a small set of the Maori ones because the purpose of the research was around uh, Indigenous and not a social economy. So um, for some of the findings, this is not all. Um, I know uh, I said earlier, we haven't presented um, all of the data but um, so the provision of culturally responsive pedagogies is limited in terms of um, teacher knowledge and practice. And I made the point much earlier around um, it's not a case of outside this classroom we don't employ or we don't use culturally responsive pedagogies, but inside the classroom we do. But when I go out, I just, I'm different. Okay. This is something that actually is, is within us, um, um, you know, that social justice stance and that valuing and that, you know, that mattering. And of course, we, we not all the teachers, but we found a number of them, um, you know, did struggle uh, in terms of um, the embedding Indigenous perspectives, listening to the stories of these children, you know, and maybe learning about language, maybe learning about cultural practices. Um, and we use the, we had the example of the, um, the turtle eggs, um, which was a, a really neat example. We also learned, and this is something that's broad across um, mathematics education, and that is that the pedagogical content knowledge, so that much deeper knowledge when it comes to mathematics, there are teachers that do not have that rich body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So superficial, and that's why there's the reliance on the textbook. Mm -hmm. But who wins with a textbook? Peace in education mm -hmm. or Wiley education. So teachers actually subjugate their authority to publishers. In this case, though, in the centre, it's a photocopying machine. Mm -hmm. And um, the work booklet's uh, probably 20 years old, and someone comes in and dabbles in it, updates a bit, mm -hmm. and staple, staple, and then, you know, it keeps on going. But that limited pedagogical content is a big one. They don't always get the strongest teachers in the centre, mm -hmm. and they need strong teachers, robust in terms of knowledge, but robust within themselves. Um, what constitutes a curriculum? Grace has made that point earlier. It was really hard to work out what curriculum was occurring. Um, so this is a big one. And I know we have a um, colleague from um, Child Safety but Youth Justice in Northern Territory. If the children come in on Saturday night at one o'clock in the morning, um, Sunday or Monday morning, they're tested literacy and numeracy. Now, for some of these young children, if they've been engaging in substance abuse, they're actually still coming down. But that test, that diagnostic, is the one that actually determines where they're levelled in terms of their literacy and their numeracy capability. And that's where they start. So if it's level books one to five, they'll start at one. And that might be two plus two. Okay, so this is a so they're already disengaged in the classroom mm -hmm. because that's not the level that they should be looking. Teachers um, really struggled with um, reasonable adjustments um, because although the students are in groups, 
by age um, and by um, capabilities. They're also grouped by whether I'm actually going to get along with all of you in that classroom because they also um, consider the security element to that too. Um, but really struggled with making reasonable adjustments and age appropriate reasonable adjustments. So if a child is still learning one plus two, when it comes to who do the hat backwards, so they're allowed to wear their hat and they're allowed to wear their shades, they might have some tattoos, and you sit down with teddy bears to do two plus one, it doesn't work, trust me. So um, more work is needed with supporting these children in culturally responsive ways. So of significance, Grace, would you like to talk to this slide? <sighs> So kind of bold and so stupid. it's yeah so there's a need, so what we found is that there's a need for teachers to have a repertoire or a, a variety of strategies to use when they they're teaching in their classroom and i mean that we our work was in the detention center but this is some stuff that we find in our mainstream classrooms as well in terms of cultural responsive pedagogy and catering for our indigenous students or students from low social economic backgrounds um, and there was also a, a greater risk of failure unless the design and instruction was actually developed with the teachers. So the teachers were part of that engagement and part of the process as well. Um, and it was also good um, that we were able to, um, when we did some of the stuff that, you know, in, in engaging Indigenous voices within the work that you're doing. Um, because it's important that we have Indigenous voices in the process work that we're doing, or otherwise it's quite meaningful. Uh, the not so meaningful, sorry, in terms of the work that we do. So if um, uh, child safety in Queensland is providing schooling, education for these children, so actual schools inside the centre, if they are providing this in the centre, they really need, because keeping in mind, the majority of these children have been excluded and marginalised from mainstream schooling. They really need to look at, um, um, and I mean, again, it's not just mathematics, it could be science, it could be horticulture, um, but looking at co more culturally responsive pedagogies um, do need to be offered to these children. Otherwise, what they're doing is reproducing what these children have already experienced, particularly in mathematics, and that is that they just get up and walk out or they don't even go. And part of the resources, so yes, we've got these, but like I said, we took it outside the detention centre. We've been working with the community and we've been working with um, the Indigenous group within the justice and is looking at creating yarning cards. So the yarning cards the teachers will be able to use, but at the same time, because we're working with justice within the department, they will also be able to engage and use yarning cards with younger people that they're working who are in that at-risk cohort that are in the detention centre, but they're actually engaging with them as well. That's, that's it. Um, pretty well there. Um, yes, Kaylee. Yeah, okay, I'm just starting the question. Thank you very much. It's a very, very nice presentation. On the board. Um, one, two questions. One is, we are talking about the teachers' assumptions about their students and uh, biases that we carry. Did you notice any assumptions about the teachers from the student? I mean, what's the other, other side of it? I mean, look, from the students, how they perceive the teachers, what their assumptions are about them? You could see through their behaviours towards their teachers. Um, and you know, they sometimes would blatantly call them names. Um, and therefore in calling them names, you know that it's not a very good relationship because you're not gonna yeah. say something bad or nasty to a teacher that you respect. Um, and so in terms of where we said we had uh, educators actually thinking about their own cultural biases, mm. then that was played out in the classrooms where you could see and they're going the, the, the disengaged um, lack of interaction mm. between the students. So if you, could, if you could see it through non-verbals, you could see it through students just 
not engaging at all. And that was through and, a few and times. And my second question is, thank you. Second question is um, about the transition. When the students leave the detention centers or the juvenile centers, then what happens, you know, what happens then? Okay, so this was an interesting conversation that we had yesterday with Rajesh as well. So um, we can tell that you know, education, it's really important that centres do provide um, schooling for these children, right? Um, but what we can't, and nor can Child Safety Department um, um, mount a case for this or have the evidence either, because once the children leave the centre, you cannot track these children because that's, um, there's an ethical issue there. And these children have the right to step outside that centre and go on and live fulfilling lives. What they don't want is, well, you know, Grace and I, or indeed the department, particularly if they've, if they've, if, if they've finished their time at the centre um, or they haven't got to do community detention here because there's varying forms of that transition out. But if, let's say they've done all their time there, and step outside that door. And don't go back into mainstream yes. schooling. So yeah. they're outside the education. Yeah, they're, they're not part. documented anywhere, but they're not tracked. So either. they're not transitioning. Some transition, Some but they may not transition back into, into, the, into a mainstream school. school. Yeah. Now, they were running a, a, an online program, BKSB, which is an English program. Interesting. That's a whole other story. But anyway, um, so when they transition out from the school uh, from the center they could continue in that online form of schooling outside and it could be in a flexi school or um you know it could be the mainstream school but not likely but maybe more in a community um uh, center where they can actually do it online with the computer and so on yeah. that's to complete their vet sets. but we will never really know it's not a question that can be answered nor can it be a question that's answered within adult prisons either. And, and I mean, one of the communities that we're working in at the moment, like we're yarning with the Indigenous people in the community. So they can say to us, oh, you know, those, those kids have gone to the such and such, which is an Indigenous organisation developed to cater for students that have left detention. And so he can tell us, but only because he's from that community and knows where the students, you know, they've come from detention and they're back in the community, but they're not in the schools, they're not in flexi schools, but there's a, an organisation that has been um, developed and that uh, work with students that have left the detention centre. A couple of questions. Um, one is um, my bad parents teach in middle school science and maths, usually in low socioeconomic schools. And I think you, um, everything you're talking about there can certainly be applied in that situation not only detention centers and as you know often kids are going between anyway um when you talked about the code of maths uh, that hit me on the head and i thought that was a very good way of expressing it because i think quite a lot of teachers as we always say, teachers are the successful people at education, so they don't often understand how it feels not to be successful. And I think particularly in maths and science, there's a certain language, there's a certain code that if you haven't grown up in a, a certain social cultural conditioning, then your access to that language is very, very limited unless the teachers do um, that culturally responsive pedagogy. Mm -hmm. But in my experiences in schools, as you're reporting, I've seen great resistance to it. Um, even when I've done professional development on the Tiwi Islands with um, teachers who are clearly engaged in Indigenous education, they've almost fled saying that's just rubbish. <laughs> you know, when I'm, I've been drawing parallels between um, TV art and maths, mm. which is so clearly well, the, the algebra. Yeah. It's brilliant. The algebra is rich in it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, Ken, yeah, something you said though there that clicked with me is to buy that soul. And it's because of the depth of knowledge you were discussing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a depth of knowledge about maths, then your ability to see it beyond the standard Western concepts of maths mm -hmm. is becomes quite limited. And that that's never mm -hmm. really struck me so much before. So mm -hmm. that that was useful. Mm -hmm. Um so I guess that's more a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. Um, my, I find your research very useful and I think definitely needs to be out there. I'm saying that I'm currently working on a project with um, a group, a European group to establish an education um, college in Timor-Leste mm -hmm. and we've been talking about how to integrate culture but also various languages like mm -hmm. Tetum. English and Portuguese and these these are very good examples mm -hmm. as posters that could be used so I was wondering if you have things like this that would be useful to pass on as examples or not yet <laughs> no, no, not yet no, yes, <laughs> at the moment, and, and like you said the work that we did in the detention center yeah. We do that sort of work outside in mainstream schools and, yes. and schools, but these resources were developed specifically yes. in a detention centre, so we worked with educators and we worked with young people. So in terms of these posters at the moment, they're only they're, for the centre. And, yeah. and so those are the conversations we're having at the moment because lots of schools are saying, this is a great resource and yeah. we'd really like to get our hands on it. But those are conversations. So the project is still that's good. It's so still it's happening. So at the moment, yeah. it's um it's been valuable resources for in in many contexts. So um what so we kind of come in under the umbrella of QUT, right? <laughs> so we know that it's a like all bureaucracies, it's a bureaucracy. So we also have a section called commercial services. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And I think, you know, well, for me, I, I can't speak for Grace, but for me, I'd actually be giving these to schools. Mm. Can't do that. Well, I mean, there, are, there are some resources, um, there are some publications I've seen in my school when I was teaching, and they're called Maths for Industry, Maths for Arts. So, so yeah. they're small booklets, mm. and they are just yeah. focused, so it's called Maths for Arts. So all the yeah. worksheets and everything are just something similar to them, That's, but they are yeah. focusing on art and then the questions with it. I have, I have seen them yeah. complete, mm. um, but so there are versions out there. But these are probably the best examples I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think these are, yeah. But what you're talking about, they're excellent. But these are a, a step mm. above. And these yeah. are these are not a program. So we developed resources to get teachers to think about how they then can go further in developing yeah. their own and, resources. And that's, the oh, thing. Yeah. That, that's the thing and I think I can see these being used. A lot of the resources that are available just now are very much um, good for explicit teaching situations whereas I can see these being used as prompts for inquiry-based learning and so forth. Yeah, so we, students can take off on their own interest. So we make sets, so we got sets printed also, there's like six to a set, so when the teacher grabs the folder that they've got six or eight, I can't remember, six or eight, so they've got a whole set then to give and work on whatever yeah. it is they're working on, but these are just starters to get mm -hmm. the teachers thinking. Yes. There's a set of them, but they're this so more for the teacher than the student, and that, that's what I like about it. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's really interesting is that, so I, um, as I said earlier, I, I teach in the undergrad and postgrad, so uh, Bachelor of Education as well as the Master of Teaching. And guess what one of their assessments is? Design, Design something like this. So they have to do um, a poster. That, and then, um, so sometimes I mix it up one year poster first, and then they've got to do a three minute, five minute oral about poster. Yeah. Or I flip it and uh, okay, I want you to do the short form first, and then I want you to develop the, uh, the poster. Yeah. And I use the same third, so you see it's broken into three. Yeah. And um, I, so they get an example, um, and I, I um, have student examples. Um, and um, that's their assessment. It's an excellent assessment. And mm. it is just astounding. So the work from this year, I'm actually in communication with the library, and that material will go up into a, it's a global student 
um, site through our library and students who uh, volunteer to put their work up because it's already been assessed and passed um, it, it goes up and is successful but it's a really good assessment strategy particularly if you're looking at you know um, culturally responsive pedagogies in your own practice if you're if you're teaching it's a way of bringing that in well, there's something I find missing in, in all the literatures of mathematics and pedagogy is they do not talk about the key idea of, of the, the mathematics. They try to make the connections and then applications, and, but somehow they miss out the key idea of mathematics. For example, the, the idea of the place value. Mm -hmm. So the, the key idea of the place value is that choosing the finite symbols to represent infinite numbers. Mm -hmm. So how to do that? I mean, so the humanity was going through this struggle using the how do you represent infinite numbers when they count, how to count. Mm -hmm. And somehow this part is missed when we talk about the place value, the, 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 the key struggle that people are going through. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think maybe something needs to be done on, the, yeah. on these lines too. Mm -hmm. Maybe these posters probably are Thank you for thinking about the history of numbers, looking at the history of how mathematics evolved. Well, you could be looking at that too. Well, yeah, that's yeah. how we used to teach. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Generally. you know, look at the the mathematics in teaching the history of mathematics. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you're getting two for the price of one. I just think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's narrowed in the stories. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just checking the time. Oh, yeah. 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 The other thing I thought was interesting was the font. Is that oh, the yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and good pick up. So yeah. we, we had a um, graphic artist um, do um, the work, the initial work, and then we had another um, graphic artist um, continue actually. This so we used Indigenous artists um, in the in So the work. some of them have got the, um, what do you call the background? Decals. Yes, yeah, um, but the initial um, graphic artist um, said, uh, taught, taught us about the, because he does a lot of this, not this kind of work, but, you know, using text. And he said that there are fonts for um, people who are dyslexic, mm -hmm. and of course, mm -hmm. we were really dyslexic. Yeah, so <laughs> said, yeah, okay, that's that's fine. Um, and there's also laminate. Um, so this laminate, um, the children, and there's also certain pens. So you can get laminated, and you can get your whiteboard cleaner markers. Um, now, so two things. Um, this laminate doesn't eventually absorb through use, it doesn't absorb the colour. The second thing is the particular pens, um, so um, children and young people are very good at tagging, not tagging. In the classroom. Like, yes. <laughs> or, you know, it might be around in the corner here, there's a tsh, you know, so there's all these little tags. Now, that you, you give them a, an overhead, a, a whiteboard marker, they'll tag, okay? And it's, you know, I'm kind of thinking back to the days of Zorro. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, whereas when they work on these, it, um, it's not that level of pen. It's a different sort. So it doesn't quite bubble on this surface, mm -hmm. but it's so easy to smudge and oh, there's no fun in that. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's all sorts of things we have to consider. It's really That's, interesting. Yeah, so, I was just wondering if you thought about family groups or whether the the people are the kids in the jail are just from too many disparate communities or communities yeah. families. Yeah. In, the, in, uh, in terms of the work that we did in maths, yeah. that would have been a bit mm -hmm. difficult because we were looking at maths. We went into the maths classrooms, so they were already established okay. maths yeah. classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so which is a bit different up here where you have family groups and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. 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 So you don't mean, you know, with kinship, the, the you're talking the, about the kinship. Yeah. 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 Um, so that actually starts to weave into statistical literacy because we know that statistical literacy is not just about you know reading statistics; it's about you know the tables and so on. But the tree diagrams also come in there, mm -hmm. and um, I know that on the IAPSIS site there's some material there that I've actually used with the students in my undergrad teaching, mm -hmm. but we didn't actually use the tree diagram, uh, the uh, the kinship. Mm -hmm. um with the students in the center mm -hmm. yeah it's quite diverse sorry I, I think yeah we're talking two different yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, i'm thinking you i thought you were talking human people in the classroom right. so it's more to do with 
Oh, no, no, it was me talking about how to group students in the classroom. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, so yeah. grouping students. Yes, in the right. group. Oh, yes. yes that's, yeah. I'm with you. Okay, I've yes. got you now. Yes. And you've answered that. Um, yeah, yeah. just yeah. a few things. You've probably come across El Kawan, Shepparton College, the work that's been done there. They've got, what's his name? Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's, he's yeah, doing John um, Bradbury. Yeah, that's yeah. John Bradbury. And what they're doing is they're looking at local, local language metaphors and replacing our Western metaphors in mathematics. And that's led to a really enhanced net outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's something maybe we can think about. And the other guru to talk to is Matt Spots. He's in the NT Department of Education. He's fantastic. He just mm -hmm. does all this. He gets the graphs, he gets people lined up outside and they have to graph themselves. It's really hands on and mm -hmm. really, yeah, it's really impactful stuff that you can do. So, yeah, yeah. and that's like the stuff we were doing in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's using the hand mind body yeah. stuff. He's just, he's, he's got you know, and thinking about community and some stuff. Yeah. Can I, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was going to ask a question about. Um, Way back at, when you started the project, which might a webs. <laughs> no, no, a webs. We remember it while well, we were yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, because I was thinking about the um, positioning of your research in a few different structures, mm -hmm. and it's quite complex. And I thought potentially how you needed to pitch it to say department families or you know, various <laughs> agencies because it's like is it a maths program or is it a cultural program and yeah. I just would be really interested to see or hear how you approach that and what challenges you might have faced. Yeah so um, it's a, it, it, a funny little story actually and I, I know that we've got to shoe out in a minute um, so I was here we go, I was sitting at a conference <laughs> And the, the short story is that um, uh, another colleague, well, I think another colleague who was sitting at the table with me, but he turned out to be the principal of the youth detention centre school. And so we introduced each other, I explained to him what I do, and he goes, if I threw $6,000 at you, would you come and do some work with my teachers? They need it. And I said, all right. So, um, and of course, I was able to put in a variation and attach it, and attach it an ethics variation, and attach it to another project. Um, so then I did, went to the um, centre school and all the teachers were in a room and I explained to them basically a lot of what the work Grace and I have done over the years with a number of other projects. And, you know, we've talked about that and, of course, that's where it started. So it was a pilot. Little, that was a little seed pilot. And from that data, that then actually, and again, always consulting with a different director, a different principal, a different college, um, and then who's who in terms of teachers. Um, but always just making sure that we had an honest, respectful relationship because, you know, there's a risk with going in and starting to peel back the layers, all right? Um, you know, you've got very strong policies pushing down. And, um, but just keeping it honest and, um, it, you know, in that sense, that's what we basically did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So that's thank a short you. story. Okay. Hey, now, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ron. Thanks, uh, Grace, uh, for the wonderful uh, uh, talk. You, you, you really enjoyed it. Uh, a round of applause to you.